the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from, the, from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Do I have to? Have you ever had somebody say that when you ask them to do something? Do I have to? Have you ever said that to someone who asked you to do something? Do I have to? I'm willing to guess that the more difficult or unpleasant a task is, the more likely somebody is to say, do I have to? I've kind of picked up on that from my kids. Do I have to? They sometimes say that to me when I give them a job to do around the house. Do I have to? It's not just something that kids say, though. It's something that maybe you've had a co-worker say when they receive a job they'd really rather not do. Do I have to? That question, do I have to, it's not just asked by kids or, or people who have unpleasant jobs. That question, do I have to, is also the question that the sinful nature asks whenever it's confronted with God's will. Do I have to? I mean, just think about the history of this world. Think about the history of mankind and God's will. Do I have to? Or maybe more accurately, do we have to? That was the defiant answer of the people after the flood who built the Tower of Babel in order to stay in one place rather than spread out over the entire earth as God told them to. Do I have to? That was Moses' selfish and doubting response when God told him to go and to liberate the people of Israel from Egypt and even promised miraculous help and God said, just send somebody, and Moses said, just send somebody else. Do, I, do we have to? That was the rebellious reply of the Israelites when they stood at the border of the promised land and God said, go in, and they wanted to go back to Egypt. Do I have to? That was the loveless response of the prophet Jonah when God told him to go and preach to the people of Nineveh and Jonah responded by hopping on a boat to the opposite end of the world. Do I have to? That was the disappointed reaction of the young man who came to Jesus who had all kinds of wealth and asked, Jesus, what do I have to do to follow you? And the Savior said, sell all that you have and then come follow me. Do I have to? It's a long history of that, that question being used by sinful people. And you know what, you and I, we've added to that list, haven't we? Do I have to? That's, that's the lazy excuse of your sinful nature when you wake up in the morning and you'd rather hit the snooze button than go to church, or when there's, there's something that you'd, you'd rather be doing than listening to God's word. Do I have to? That's not just a childish response that kids give to their parents, but it's the rebellion of the sinful nature of those little children who are defying God's gracious gift of parents to them. Do I have to? That's the excuse of your sinful nature. Every time that God's will asks you to to make a sacrifice for the good of your neighbor, or to hold your tongue and you'd rather speak evil about somebody? Do I have to? That is always the defiant and determined defense that the old you throws up in opposition to God's will. You see, every human being, you included, asks that question, do I have to, as a way of challenging God, except usually we're not so blatant about it. We've gotten really good at making that question, do I have to, sound a lot better than I've made it sound as I'm speaking to you tonight. Usually, we've got some ways of making that question, do I have to, sound pretty sensible, pretty reasonable, pretty rational. 
You almost make it sound like it's the right thing to ask and that God's kind of the, the sourpuss, the, the, the stick in the mud, the, the guy who's just got to ruin everything with his demands and his will. I mean, do I have to? Do I really have to be nice to that person who betrayed me? Do I really have to be nice to that co-worker who took credit for the stuff that I did? Do I have to be nice? Do I really, do I really have to be kind to that friend who abandoned me? Do I really have to be nice to that spouse who's abused my kindness time and time and time again over years? Do I really have to listen to my parents when they ask me to do something that just doesn't make any sense or contradicts something else that they said? Do I really have to? Do I have to sacrifice my happiness for, for hearing God's word or for doing some other part of, of his will? Really? Is that, is that really what God would want me to do? Sacrifice my happiness? We have a way of making that question sound like it's the right question to ask. But really, every time we ask that question, do I have to, and we ask it about God's will, we really are being rebellious. And we're earning for ourselves God's wrath and his punishment. That's what that question really deserves an answer. But then you think about the words from Galatians that I read to you earlier. And you probably notice that God's wrath and his punishment aren't mentioned there at all. No, instead, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, those words were originally addressed to believers in a region of the world called Galatia, thousands of miles away from Saginaw, Michigan. Those words speak of blessings that are meant for believers of all times and all places, including you here in Saginaw, Michigan tonight. Those blessings that are mentioned are God's grace. The grace that, that he's poured out in order to forgive your sins. Because of that grace of God that has washed your sins away, you also now have peace. Instead of that rebellion and strife, there's peace between you and God. And wherever that grace and peace exist, that enables Christians to call God Father. It enables you to call God your Father. Think about what that means, that you get to call God your Father. It means that He loves you, that He cares for you, that He watches over you, that He protects you. All of that is true because the Lord Jesus Christ gave Himself for our sins according to the will of God. You see, when you and I think of God's will, it's very easy for us to think of that will of God as the commands that God has, the things that God expects you and me to do, that he wants us to do, the things that, that so often we look at and say, do I really have to do that? But God's will also includes his plan to save rebellious people like you and me. God's will was that Jesus should give himself for your sins. God's will was that Jesus should deliver himself over to death in order to deliver you from the evil of this world. God's will was that the Savior should yield his breath on the cross so that you could breathe eternal life. God's will was that Jesus should endure the shame and the blows that were visited and rained down upon him as he went to the cross, so that you could have life forever. Do I have to? Think about that, that passion history reading we heard a few minutes ago. There was no do I have to in what Jesus said. He broke that, that long history of responding to God's will by saying, do I have to? With instead saying, I will do it. I will do that will of yours, my Father. Our Savior, we find 
a willing substitute, someone who was willing to take your place and my place. And you just think about that passion history, just the little part of it that we heard tonight. And you hear that willingness of Jesus. He was willing. You heard it in how he said that he had earnestly desired to celebrate that Passover, the Passover that would mark his death. Jesus was willing to be your Savior. And you can see it in the fact that, that he was willing to, to take Judas on as one of his friends, even though Judas would betray him. And he was even willing to take all those other 11 disciples as his friends, even though they would abandon him. Jesus was willing to rescue you. And you can see it in the fact that even though he knew the plot against him, he didn't use that knowledge to run or to escape that death that lay before him. You think of that hymn verse we just sang a few moments ago. Jesus was willing to endure blows and shame and bitter death. You think about that. Could those Roman soldiers have stretched out Jesus' hands to extend them and nail them to the cross if he wasn't willing to let them do that? Is there any power in this world that has ever existed or will ever exist that could have suspended Jesus on that cross if he didn't want to go there? You know that there's no power that could have made the Son of God go to that cross if he didn't want to, if he wasn't willing. Do I have to? That wasn't Jesus' response. Despite the agony that lay before him, he said, I will go to that cross, and I will do what is necessary to save you. And so that question, do I have to? It really makes crystal clear the difference between you and me and our Savior Jesus. Your sinful nature always says, do I have to, when it comes to God's will. But that Savior Jesus, he never said, do I have to, when it came to that will of God, even when it cost him his life. That question, do I have to, not only makes clear the difference between us and our Savior, it also makes crystal clear the depth of his love for you and for me. Even though Jesus knew what he was going to suffer. He never said, do I have to? Rather, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Even if he had to suffer shame and blows and bitter death. And so upon the cross, we find a Savior who is willing to redeem irredeemable people like you and me. Amen. Please stand. Now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.